and thanks to the whole team that's putting this wonderful event together. This is my first year participating in the event, but I hope that sometime in the future I can come to Nashville and we can actually all do this in person. All that being said, I am so excited that you all chose to join the conference and come to this session where we'll be talking about SQL Edge to Cloud and kind of taking a different look on how data can really be the foundation for your modern applications. Um, for me, I'm Anna Hoffman. I work at Microsoft on the Azure Data Program Management team. So basically what that means is I sit on the engineering team and the products we manage, build, develop, and develop include SQL Server, Azure SQL, Cosmos DB, other open source databases on Azure. Um, I think that about covers what my direct team works on. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you all about some of the ways you can use SQL for different things. And really, I want to try to spin this on customer examples. So we'll talk about some of the tech, but we'll also talk about customer examples. And I also have a few demos for you all. Um, if you like this type of session and you want to see more of it, I do have a session later this week in the Music City Tech Code side of things. So you can maybe choose to check that out later as well. All right, let's get right into it. So we've all heard about or talked about digital transformations for some time now, but not many realize the role that data really plays in these successful transformation. For us, if there's one thing that 2020 has taught us, it's that data truly is the strategic asset for businesses today. And what we've observed is that those that have embraced their data as a strategic asset have fared better. They've established the culture and the capabilities needed to be more agile and to anticipate potential disruptions and pivot as needed to better serve their customers. All that being said, doing this is not easy given the realities of data today. The volume, variety, and velocity of data are all accelerating dramatically and the complexity of creating a truly enterprise knowledge graph can seem insurmountable. In fact, IDC predicts that by 2025, which is just a few years from now, the world's data will climb to 175 zettabytes. So if you put that in perspective, if you wanted to store all of that data in a stack of Blu-ray disks, you could go to the moon and back about 23 times. So that's a lot of data. I'm not sure either of those numbers I can really put in perspective, but hopefully give you some point of reference. But without the right people, processes, and capabilities in place, it's going to be difficult to answer some of these questions we have a lot, like what data does my organization have? Is it trustworthy? It, does the data have integrity? Are people getting the data that they need to make the right decisions? And are they getting it fast enough? And are we managing our data in a compliant way? You know, privacy is really everything these days. Now, getting the right answers to these questions is possible when all your data assets are connected and managed in a cohesive fashion. This is when you truly enable a digital feedback loop within your organization and provide the foundation for successful digital transformations. At the heart of this digital feedback loop is, of course, data. Flowing across in which an organization operates is this constant stream of data. And when you can harness this data and apply intelligence to it, you're going to enable better decisions and transformative processes. A few things we're aiming for, right? We want to engage customers in new and meaningful ways. We want to transform our products based on the signals from our end users, as well as the products themselves. You want to empower employees with real-time insights so that you can make the right decisions and be agile. And finally, we wanna optimize our operations by better anticipating customer demands and supply chain disruptions. Now, all this sounds fine and dandy, but what about the numbers? Show me the data. So this was a very interesting study that I reviewed um, this was from the Harvard Business Review, and they said that organizations that embrace data for driving their digital transformations, as opposed to those that did not, saw a 54% growth in revenue and profits, a 62 enhancement to their customer satisfaction, and a 44% faster time to market. So this is a pretty you know, substantial lift just by embracing your data and embracing the modernization that's required. Now, for the rest of the session, I'm going to be talking about Microsoft's suite of products. Um, but what I want you to know is that there are a lot of leaders in this space, but I want to talk about, want to ensure you all that Microsoft is also a leader in this space, 
but there are other services and database platforms that you've heard of. I know there was already a question uh, in the chat before the session about Oracle. So there are other data solutions, but what I wanna show you is SQL over the years and how Microsoft and Azure are really working to enable new scenarios. So we're gonna focus on scenarios. So let's go back in time for a minute, back to a time, to be honest, I'm not even sure I was alive, but back when SQL Server first started, uh, we kind of started on desktops, right? And as we grew as an organization, we cut our teeth as the number one department server database. And then we gained a reputation with enterprises because of our ease of use and price performance. Then we boldly went to the cloud in 2008 as the world's first platform as a service database with Azure SQL Database. We then embraced new operating systems like Linux, and we evolved into a data platform, including things like built-in machine learning and AI, all of which these things I wanna show you today with real world examples and demonstrations. We also enabled things like IoT for new scenarios, and we tied all this together with one engine that has been a proven engine and an industry leader for almost 30 years now. We've come a long way, and if you think about it, top, today, 98 of the top Fortune 100 companies run SQL Server. And while many organizations are still running SQL Server at the heart of their business, they've also adopted new application scenarios and new types of databases to which that many of the Azure data services are built on that innovation. And we're going to continue to do this as part of our SQL and all up Azure strategy. At the heart of this strategy, like I've mentioned, is really extending SQL from edge to cloud. So we're gonna put the TC, Microsoft SQL engine, your T-SQL skills and all your favorite tools at the heart of where all this innovation is happening. So we can grow together as we go towards these more advanced digital transformations. We want to equip you to reimagine the art of what's possible. And all of these things we're gonna talk about, we're enabling you to do them anywhere. And so for the rest of this talk, I want to focus on some of the latest enhancements that we've made to these five SQL-based offerings. And more importantly, I wanna show you how these enhancements are helping companies in their journey of digital transformation. So I want to start at the edge and Azure SQL Edge is kind of our newest addition to the family of SQL based products. It's going to offer the full power of SQL Server at the edge, along with built in capabilities for streaming, time series and artificial intelligence. So why did we invest in the edge? Let's talk about the recent explosion of IoT devices such as sensors, drones and cameras. They've been driving significant growth of data at the edge. And this new promise of 5G means we're gonna have even more data, even more endpoints, and in more places, providing even more of a need for intelligence and analytics to be processed at scale and as close to the source as possible. One study predicts that by 2025, 75% of enterprise generated data will actually be created and processed outside of the data center or cloud at the edge. And that's up from just 20% today. So why is Azure SQL relevant? Let's talk about a few things Azure SQL can do, and then I wanna take you through a customer example. So with Azure SQL Edge, you can stream, store, and analyze time series data using things like time windowing, aggregation, and filtering capabilities, and you can achieve deeper insights by combining data types such as time series and graph. Additionally, we've taken technologies from other Azure sources like Azure Streaming Analytics and Azure Machine Learning to really build this into the edge, meaning that you can deploy models that were trained anywhere, maybe on the edge, but maybe somewhere else. You can deploy those models to Azure SQL Edge and actually make those decisions at the edge on the IoT device itself. This is going to enable you and really free you from that need to be connected to send these you know, result up and get the predictions back on your device. And for scenarios like manufacturing and other scenarios where connectivity is not great, uh, Azure SQL Edge can run in a fully connected, semi-connected or completely disconnected state, which is just gonna help you run this analytics at the edge regardless of network connectivity. And finally, Azure SQL Edge is gonna give you the flexibility to run on Windows, or Linux on ARM, six, ARM devices or on x64 based architectures. So there's really a lot of things you can do with Azure SQL Edge. And one example is 3M. Now 3M is a very familiar household name. 
Uh, it's unusual to find a work desk that doesn't include some of its products like Scotch tape and Post-it notes. And 3M actually produces more than 60,000 products in various categories, including the N95, which has been you know, instrumental in our fight against COVID. Now, our team participated and partnered with one of the U.S. manufacturing plants and the 3M Corporate Research Lab to improve predictive anomalies in these manufacturing sites. The plant's network connectivity was limited, and so it made it difficult to gather, transfer, and use the data for predictive maintenance. The team decided to move all the data processing and AI to the edge with Azure SQL Edge. So imagine the full power of SQL Server with added AI and time series capabilities running on these tiny little edge devices all over the plant. Azure SQL Edge was also able to resolve that connectivity issues and because the data was being processed and AI is happening where the data was actually being generated. Today, this predictive maintenance solution allows 3M to kind of fix anomalies. I use anomalies to fix and, and do preventative maintenance uh, to you know, prevent these anomalies and disruptions from occurring. So this is one great example of how Azure SQL Edge is kind of enabling new scenarios. Now, I want to talk a little bit about SQL Server and probably regardless of what sector of technology you fall into, um, at some point you've worked with SQL Server or heard of SQL Server, maybe, I'm guessing. Now, the over the years, for almost 30 years now, SQL Server has been helping enterprises manage all facets of their relational data. However, in recent releases, SQL Server has gone beyond relational by unifying things like graph and relational and JSON and bringing machine learning to where the data is with things like support for R and Python and Java for model training and scoring. And as the volume and variety of data increases, customers need to easily integrate and analyze data across all types of data. So with SQL Server 19, we really made SQL the hub for an organization's entire data estate. And one big way that we did this was with data virtualization, which uses polybase, te polybase technology to allow you to essentially push down queries to all of your data sources, get intelligent performance, memory optimized TempDB, and so much more. SQL Server 2019 was the first time we also announced big data clusters, and it's the first of its kind because it removed that chasm that exists today between operational stores and analytics platform. We're now giving you HDFS and Spark from SQL. It's Really amazing to see what some of our customers have done with this. And one customer I like to highlight is Itao Unibanco. So they are the largest bank in Brazil and the 10th largest bank in the world operating in the finance and insurance market. Now, their concern was that their infrastructure would not keep up with their growth. And this would then affect their SLAs and ultimately their business. I'm sure this is something, you know, a lot of us can relate to. Now, a good example is when they had to perform a rollback of an operation. This is something that would take a long time. On average, it took four to five hours to do a rollback. And sometimes a recovery could take as long as 40 hours. And you could see how this would be disruptive to the business. Itao decided to become an early adopter of SQL Server 2019 to take full advantage of what we call intelligent query processing and accelerated database recovery. With accelerated database recovery, they were able to drop that rollback from, uh, from four to five hours to a matter of seconds. We say rollback faster than you can react. And intelligent query processing made over 90% of their queries run faster. And the cool thing about that is that this was with no code changes. So you just move to SQL Server 2019 and you just run faster. And that's kind of the improvements and the vision that we have uh, for our customers so we can enable you to kind of do more with what you have. So that's kind of the more of the disconnected state, but we understand that really this is a hybrid world and Azure Arc is at the heart of our hybrid strategy. And Azure Arc is really kind of at the cutting edge of technology innovation because it's bringing together SQL, Kubernetes and Azure to run fully managed cloud data services basically anywhere on your top choice of hardware and OS. But before I talk about Azure Arc, I wanted to mention that SQL Server in 2016 uh, released support for containers. Now containers has been a huge innovation 
uh, for the application space because they're portable, lightweight, and efficient. And the same applies for running databases. So we announced these in 2016, we've enhanced them in 2017, and in 2019, we added some new things like Active Directory support. Um, but because of this innovation that we did on SQL Server containers and running SQL Server on Linux, this opened up the opportunity for us to be able to run on Kubernetes. Um, so Azure Arc was really the platform that Microsoft and really the data team started uh, that's going to extend Azure management and enable Azure services to run across on-prem, the edge, and even other clouds. So basically this thing, this thing that I call Azure Arc is bringing three main things I wanted to mention. First, with Azure Arc, you can bring these platform as a service type of capabilities that is essentially versionless SQL to anywhere you are. Um, and second, uh, you can enable with Azure Arc, since it's all running on Kubernetes, we can take advantage of the scale to be able to scale out and scale back down um, using your hardware, not using our hardware and not having to over provision hardware so that can help you be more efficient. And finally, you can kind of get to see your Azure resources all in one place, whether it's in Azure, on-prem, in another cloud, anywhere you can run Kubernetes, you can now get managed Azure data services. So an interesting scenario for this involves KPMG. Now, KPMG is a global network of member firms providing professional services. They have over 220,000 employees. And of course, they're always looking to stay at the cutting edge of technology. In Tokyo, there's a development team called Ignition, and they're building out a next-gen cloud-native application platform to serve their clients called Cloud Next. Now, of course, they want to harness the latest cloud innovations, but KPMG's clients often require running their applications and storing their data on-prem or multiple clouds to comply with government regulation or company policy. Now with Azure Arc, KPMG and KPMG's clients can extend Azure's management capabilities and data platform services to any infrastructure. This is going to allow KPMG to build applications once and run them anywhere. The built-in automated management services like self-service provision, elastic scalability, backup restore, and automatic updates saves them time and ensures that they're always using the most latest, up-to-date, most secure database platform. All right, so we've talked about the edge, we've talked about on-prem, we've talked about hybrid. Now we're gonna move into the cloud. And I wanna start by saying that Azure SQL is the largest platform, platform as a service running in Azure. It was part of the initial la launch of Windows Azure back in 2008. And it's not just hosting SQL Server in the cloud, but we've really built it from the ground up. And I'll show you a few examples. Again, as a data person, uh, I wanted to, to show you all some data to kind of support why customers are moving to Azure and how this is helping and doing things like converting CapEx to OpEx uh, and also increasing the productivity of your IT department, uh, increasing savings from avoided hardware, and this huge number of overall three-year return on investment. So again, um, these are all studies done by a third party called Forrester. So if you're interested in reading more about how these numbers uh, came to be like I am, <laughs> you could go check those out. All right, so now let's focus on the good stuff. Let's talk about Azure SQL. Now, Azure SQL is a family of solutions that we've developed so that we can meet your situation wherever you are, whether that's, you know, you want to move to the cloud as fast as possible. So you're just going to lift and shift or fail over your, your virtual machines and your SQL servers to the same OS, the same version, into SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machine. You'll hear us call this as IaaS or Infrastructure as a Service. Um, and, and this is really great if you need access to the OS. You're still gonna be responsible for updates and that sort of thing, but we can give you a little bit of platform as a service goodness. Now, if you don't need access to the OS and you want to take advantage of some of the, the managed capabilities and versionless SQL in the cloud, then Azure SQL Managed Instance is the next great choice. It kind of abstracts away that level layer of the OS for you and gives you essentially a managed SQL server. So you get all the instance scope capabilities like DTC, database mail, uh, linked server, service broker, 
um, machine learning services, all these things that you're used to getting in SQL Server on-prem, you can get in Azure SQL Managed Instance. Now, if you don't need that, and maybe you're creating new applications, and that's where Azure SQL Database comes into the picture, because we abstract away the instance level for you, and you just get a database. But this is when you're going to start getting innovations like hyperscale and serverless, which I'm going to show you a scenario for soon. Now, I do want to remind you all, maybe this is new, uh, maybe this is a lot of information, but I wanted to share that we don't just deal with SQL Server-based products. You can see that we have platform as a service offerings for many of the most popular uh, open source databases like Postgres, uh, MySQL, MariaDB. Within Azure Cosmos DB, we have support for APIs like MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, and SQL. So really wherever you are or whatever process step you are, whatever technology you're using, there's gonna be something here. Um, and, and we're always innovating across those. And one example is hyperscale. Hyperscale, I think it's really interesting because what we essentially did is we took apart our product and said, hey, this engine is great, but we need to be able to scale up and scale out uh, and really build a cloud native architecture. And that's what we've been doing with SQL. That's what we've been doing with Postgres. And that's what we're working on with MySQL. And so you can scale up to 100 terabytes and there's no hardware that's limiting us from going higher in size. Now, to show off some of these latest innovations, I wanted to show you an example for Azure SQL Database, which includes hyperscale, serverless, and some of the latest uh, dev innovations like CICD, GitHub Actions, that sort of thing. I'm gonna warn you, this is a lot in one demo, so we're gonna go fast, um, but hopefully you find it interesting and useful. All right, so what you're seeing is a simple application. Uh, this is a fitness tracking application that I built. It's very simple. You've probably seen applications like this before. It simply tracks some information about steps and distance related to my runs. Um, I can even go ahead and start a new workout by clicking that start workout. Now, while I'm working out or while I'm going on a run, it's going to log this information locally and that's going to help me optimize my battery and performance of the application and the rest of my phone. Um, however, when I stop this workout, what we're going to do is we're going to send that data up to an Azure SQL database, hyperscale database. You see that there. And this is going to store the data for just me, as well as all the other customers of my application. You can see it's currently about 13 terabytes in size, and it can grow as big as it needs to. Um, now, one thing we noticed with this application is that many users, like myself, forget to hit the end workout button when their workout completes. So what we did is we built a simple machine learning model that essentially is able to determine when a workout ended. Once it's done that, we can simply update the records in the application. Um, and just for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to show that update step. But one of the key things is when we update this data, we want to update it in our application, but we don't want to have to update all of the data. We don't want to be sending all that data to and from the wire for different users uh, and even for different workouts that I didn't update. Now, with change tracking in Azure SQL Database, again, this is something available in all our SQL products, we were able to do that uh, much in a much simpler way. So what you're going to see is if I hop over to Visual Studio Code, you can see I have some SQL scripts and one is I'm using a change table. So I'm using a change table to say, hey, um, I really only want to track training sessions from a specific version. OK, so I'm going to be able to version things and then only pull the version that I need. And we're using JSON here. I told you we're supporting other models now, um, but this is going to make me able to easily process in my application. So if we switch over, I'm just going to do a quick API call and call from the latest version. And now what you're going to see is I'm only getting that update operation. I'm not getting all the other workouts. I'm not pulling all that extra data. This is really going to help me perform better and optimize my application. Now, if we go back and I refresh the application, you're going to see that blue number is just resulting in the change that we made just now. So we're only pulling what we need to pull and we're optimizing things. It looks like uh, some people aren't able to see my screen. Yeah, it is um, looking a little pixelated, Anna, just so you know. Ah, uh, 
That's unfortunate. Let me see what, if I can change something. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, if only if Zoom could do some better chain tracking. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that that was kind of an issue for you all. Basically, what I was showing uh, is that and I'm not sure how long it was bad, but um, basically, what I was trying to show is that we were able to create that change table and update that JSON. Uh, very easily. Um, so just blame Apple. That's pretty funny. Um, but <laughs> um, but what we're able to do is just show how we can only bring the changes back and forth, how we're only having to uh, go back and forth with the changes. And you can see on the screen here how we were only bringing back that latest update that we did. Not all the inserts, not other users' data, nothing like that. So that's a great example for seeing um, hyperscale for our production use cases. But as you can imagine, there's still some work that I need to do on this application. There's still some enhancements that I wanna make. And one of those enhancements is adding the temperature column. Cause I think we might be able to correlate temperature and performance of different folks' runs or exercises. So what I'm doing in Visual Studio Code is I'm just pushing up some changes and uh, while it's pushing up, I'll tell you what's happening. So we basically added that temperature column and we're going to add it to the JSON data that we're returning in the application. Again, we don't have to change anything else. Uh, we're just using stepwise to track this. Now, if I go into GitHub Actions, which is where I've kind of been pushing up this code, I can see that earlier today I ran scripts one, two, and three, but we just added scripts four and five, which add that temperature column. Um, we can see just from that push, we were able to uh, push that up and we can see it's kicked off a build. So Azure SQL database does support GitHub Actions. So it's able to very easily update using either a DAC pack file or scripts. And now that that's running, um, we can see that's running. It'll just take just a few moments. But in the meantime, what I wanted to show you is since this is my dev side of things, I'm actually using a serverless database. So this is going to allow me to set a min and a max amount of compute, and it's going to auto scale me on a per second basis for the max of what I actually need. Um, so this means when I'm not using the database, the database will actually go into a pause state and I'll only pay for storage. So that's why you see here the CPU build is is only quite high when I'm using it often and then the database pauses. So this is kind of a lot of stuff to show, but it, it shows kind of the benefits of serverless for those development workloads. And finally, if I come back to GitHub Actions, I can see that that completed and four and five were applied to my database so I can get back to developing and working on these new temperature capabilities. Um, I'm, I'm, again, sorry about some of the issues with the demo, but hopefully you were able to see some of it. And I apologize for any of the anxiety that that battery level <laughs> <laughs> provides any of you. Um, all right, so let's switch back to the slides. Uh, so there what we were talking about is Azure SQL database. And again, you saw some of the latest innovations like hyperscale and serverless. But what we've noticed is a lot of people might not necessarily be ready to jump and take all their legacy applications and move right into that service. Because again, it's just the database scoped features that you're getting. You're not getting instance scope features. You don't have access to the OS. So if you need your third party applications to have access to the OS, then you know this limits you to moving towards IaaS pretty quickly or Azure SQL Managed Instance a little quickly as well. Now, one thing we've seen is there's really a difference between migrating and modernizing. Now, when we say migrating, as it sounds, we're just talking about moving your applications and your infrastructure and your data from on-prem to the cloud. So that's migration. So if you want to migrate really fast, migrating to a virtual machine is, is very fast. So it's a great way to migrate and just kind of lift and shift your things into the cloud. We have a lot of customers that do this. Now, alternatively, you could modernize and you could modernize and migrate at the same time. But modernize is more of this idea of upgrading, whether that's upgrading to a later version of SQL Server, upgrading to a platform as a service, upgrading to a managed Azure Arc service. Uh, so these are all options that you have, and it's going to depend on a few things, like what's your immediate business need? How much time do you have? How hard is this going to be to uh, 
to do that? And how much time do you have to invest in this? Obviously, if you migrate and modernize, you're going to get the best performance, the best value. Uh, but sometimes that's not the, the best thing for our customers. Um, so there's really a few things that we see. I mentioned, you know, Azure SQL database is great for those new applications. If you're migrating, SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machine is great. Uh, interestingly enough, we have a lot of customers that move to SQL Server on a virtual machine first and then start to evaluate now that they're in the cloud and everything else is up in the cloud, they're ready to move towards a platform as a service like Azure SQL Managed Instance or Azure SQL Database. I wanted to give you an example of a customer and that is H&R Block. And they're an example of a customer that took this phased approach, which I really, really think is kind of a good approach for many of our customers. Uh, so amidst changes in the tax industry, Basically, H&R Block realized they needed to rethink how they use technology to serve their clients with a seamless experience. In order to do this, they needed to simplify their data strategy and unite a set of disparate data sources spread across multiple legacy technologies. So they looked for privacy and security, and they were looking for scalability. So they decided to upgrade to SQL Server 2017 and move to SQL Server in an Azure virtual machine. This was a big boot for them, a big upgrade for them, a big migration for them. And once they did this and they started to connect up to other things, they realized they could get more out of their investments by moving to Azure SQL Managed Instance. And this is a way that they kind of were able to take a phased approach to migrate and modernize their applications. And by doing this, they were able to eliminate data silos and they can now quickly spin up new solutions in Azure for other things for reporting, for analytics, for other applications, uh, and really improve the experience for their internal employees as well as their customers. Now, I don't have a demo for, <laughs> for H&R Block specifically, but I do have a managed instance demo that I wanted to share with you. And before I do that, I am just, just wanted to comment, like I'm loving all the questions coming in and all the things coming in. I'm very excited to see it. Uh, I will be answering all these on Whova because I think we don't won't have enough time at the end of this session. But I just want to say I really appreciate all the engagement. And here's to hoping that this next demo doesn't get all pixelated. But again, I can count on you all to let me know in the chat if it does. Now, this next demo that I'm going to show you is really showing how you can use Azure SQL Managed Instance to be like and to take a phased approach to migration in conjunction with SQL Server Reporting Services, or SSRS, as well as Azure Virtual Machines, and then how you can modernize on top of that with things like Power BI and Azure Machine Learning Services. So again, another pack demo. We'll see if it pixelates. I hope not, um, but let's try it out. Okay, so what you're seeing on the screen here is an Azure SQL Managed Instance. So again, this is going to have all those instance scope capabilities like SQL Server Agent. And uh, what we're doing here is we work for a company called AdventureWorks. Um, now, in the Azure portal, I'm going to use a SQL Server 2019 Reporting Services or SSRS virtual machine. So this has it already installed. I could even deploy one that has SQL Server and SSRS already installed. So this is one way we're making that lift and shift of whatever you have on-prem or somewhere else easier into Azure. And glad it's looking good so far. Um, I actually went ahead and deployed this VM. I'm actually in that VM right now, and that's what you're looking at. Um, but now we can switch over to that SSRS instance to some of our reports. And you can see I have a few reports. And what's interesting is I can actually host those SSRS databases in Azure SQL Managed Instance. So again, I moved off of SQL Server, and I'm hosting the, those report server DBs in Managed Instance. Now, if we take a look at the reports, uh, you can see how we're doing. And one thing I notice is this variance for our quota. Like we are way blowing our quota out of the water, which makes me think like maybe we didn't have a good quota to begin with because we're, you know, beating it by 40, 75, like very high percent. I mean, we have great salespeople, but, um, and if you look at our quota predictions, that's that gray dotted line, you can see there doesn't really seem to be a rhyme or reason. And we don't even have a consistent quota across the months. So let's say based on this, I want to start modernizing this experience and create a better model using machine learning services, which is built into Azure SQL Managed Instance. So what I'm gonna do for that is I'm gonna switch over to Azure Data Studio. 
And there's actually an extension that is going to make this easier. It's called the Azure Machine Learning Extension in Azure Data Studio. You can see I have that here, and that's going to enable me to very easily manage packages in my database, deploy other models to my database, and make predictions on, on database I already have. So I have this uh, Python notebook, and what I'm doing is I'm just pasting in uh, some notes about these strange quota values. And uh, what I'm trying to show off here is notebooks. So you've probably seen notebooks before in Jupyter or something else, but notebooks in Azure Data Studio are great because we're gonna take care of converting all that to Markdown. You don't have to write Markdown. You can just write stuff, bring in screenshots and we'll take care of the Markdown. You can also write Markdown if you want. Anyways, uh, we start to do some analysis and we notice that we do have 161 missing quota values. And if we try to see the relationship between sales and quota, we don't really see one. So what we can do, and I know I'm going fast, but what we can do is essentially train a model in Python. We can start to look at the data. And once we're happy with that model, we can actually deploy it. So now I'm in a SQL notebook. We can actually deploy that model into the database. So we're going, that's what I'm doing here. I'm creating uh, the model as a serialized model. And then once we have that serialized model, we can use it to make predictions on our new data for basically our new quota. And here I'm calling that adjusted quota. So you can see we don't have any null values and we'll see in a moment if they got any better. So back in SSRS, I'm just going to add these two new columns for adjusted quota. And you can see now we have maybe a much more realistic, maybe it's not the shiniest view we wanted, but it's a much more realistic view of what our quota should be and how we're tracking. Uh, now, one more thing I can do is I kind of continue to modernize is I can very easily lift and shift this report up into Power BI Premium uh, if I want to move from SSRS to Power BI. So you can kind of see, and I know it was a lot <laughs> in not a lot of time, um, but you can kind of see how uh, we're giving you these options to kind of migrate and modernize at your own pace, but start to get benefits along the way as you do. So you've seen a lot, you're probably wondering, okay, how complicated is it to migrate? But the good news is, is that we have these custom guides. So if you take nothing away from this, that top right link, aka.ms slash data migration, we have these custom guides that are gonna give you step-by-step -step instruction to go from, uh, from any source to any target. Uh, and we're gonna take you through that journey. And I see a comment uh, that uh, some of these demos just show how much I don't know. Um, and that's okay. There's a lot to know and there's a lot to learn and there's always a lot to learn in this space. Um, so I, I'm definitely going to provide lots of resources for you all uh, to go learn more if this is something you're interested in. And you should also know that like we're going to do what we can to make this uh, an easy transition for you. So we have services, we have videos, all sorts of stuff for you to, to learn whatever it is that you want to learn or need to learn. All right, so the final thing I want to talk about is Azure Synapse. And Azure Synapse is the first and only analytics system to have run all TPCH queries at a petabyte scale. So uh, the reason this is possible is because the same intelligent query processing engine in SQL Server also ships in Azure Synapse. Now, if you haven't heard of Azure Synapse, let's talk about some what ifs. What if you could make better decisions and accelerate your time to insights from months to hours by simplifying your analytics? What if you could enhance all your team's productivity by enabling them to use their existing skills for all your analytics needs? And what if you could apply AI to all of your data without moving it around? That's what we had in mind when we created Azure Synapse Analytics, which is basically brought together enterprise data warehousing and big data analytics. There's a lot of stuff here. I don't have a ton of time to talk about it, but you can see how we're basically bringing this one view through Synapse Studio for you to do your integration, your management, your monitoring, security. We're bringing you SQL, we're bringing you Spark, uh, all on top of Azure Data Lake Storage with deep integrations with things like Power BI and Azure Machine Learning Services. And even more recently, what we have done is we've introduced a bridge between Azure Databases and Azure Synapse with something called Azure Synapse Link. So you can now get near real-time insights from your live operational data stores without going through that complex ETL or using additional compute resources. 
this is really, this is really big. This is really where the future is. We have this for Cosmos DB today. You can expect this is something we're working on for other services as well. And that brings me into kind of the last topic. And that topic is the future. So I want to just share a few items about the future before we close out this session. And again, I will answer all your questions uh, after this uh, on the Whova app. Um, but as we look forward, where are we investing? So as a team, we are investing in unifying SQL across cloud and on-prem. We're going to completely blur the lines. You're going to be able to get platform as a service anywhere. Uh, and, and we're going to bring you, we're going to bring Azure to you, even if you can't come to Azure. We're also focusing more on developers. Uh, we want to expand our experiences to meet modern frameworks and languages like Django, which we just announced some support for, Node, Angular, and even things like Spring Data. We're going to enhance JSON and Graph to support. We're going to increase our intelligent database investments. And we're going to start to integrate better with things like Azure Functions, Azure Web Apps, and the Power Platform. This one's a really exciting one to me because we're going to bring together the best of hyperscale, serverless, and elastic pools. We didn't talk about elastic pools, but this is basically a simple cost-effective solution for managing and scaling multiple databases that have varying and unpredictable usage. So you can resource share. Um, basically, we're going to bring all these services together into one thing, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be a really exciting thing. Uh, we're also investing in confidential computing. One thing maybe you, you noticed or you haven't heard of, but we recently built blockchain into Azure SQL database. It's called Azure SQL Ledger, where we're bringing the power of blockchain without all the complexity uh, to your existing databases. So you can enable this, you can create ledger tables, and you can create basically an immutable store to protect your data. We also introduce always encrypted with secure enclaves, which leverages a special technology and uh, also Azure purview for governance. And finally, of course, we're going to keep investing in Azure SQL and SQL Server. So we're not gonna stop creating versions of SQL Server. So you don't have to worry about that. SQL Server is very near and dear to us. And it's this engine that powers everything you've seen today. Uh, finally, even with the best technical innovation, no product is going to be successful without a strong community. So our philosophy has always been kind of community centric. And I just want to thank all of you for being a part of this community or maybe starting to become a part of this community. Uh, we have a very nice community. You can use the hashtag SQL family or hashtag SQL help on Twitter. And you always are going to get answers to your questions. Uh, so I'm deeply thankful for our community, and I think uh, a lot of folks are as well. Um, it seems like I lost the slide that has my information on it, so I'm just going to put back up this slide again. Uh, if you need anything, uh, I would direct you to uh, my Twitter. You can send me a direct message. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. That's up in the top right-hand corner. And all the resources I talked about, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Uh, I stream videos weekly and release short recorded videos. We've got videos from the product groups uh, all the time, all the different topics you've seen today. We go into deep dives on that. Um, and I know I'm over time. So I just wanted to thank you all for spending time with me and say that I will answer all of your questions as soon as I get off this.